Robert H. Brown grew up in upstate New York and enlisted in the U.S. Army immediately after graduating from Boston University. Rising from private to lieutenant colonel in the military, Robert had 11 years of overseas assignments in Europe. Upon military retirement, he became a management consultant in Northern Virginia, working with clients ranging from the Ritz-Carlton Hotel to the Department of Defense School System, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the U.S. State Department's Diplomatic Telecommunications Service, U.S. Joint Forces Command, U.S. Marine Corps Special Operations Command, and the U.S. Army's Counter IED Program. It's amazing. Amazing. Besides a bachelor's degree, Robert holds advanced degrees in vocational counseling and urban and environmental planning. He currently serves as the adjutant and historian for Post 146. Today, Robert is going to be talking about the women in World War II. So I introduce to you now, Robert Brown. Thank you, Susan. I hope this uh, continues to work all day. If not, the other one's back there. Fantastic. I'm going to take this jacket off because it's pretty muggy. And we're going to talk not just about women, but a special group of women. They're called the WASP. Now, we're not talking about women that, that are insects. We're talking about the women Air Force service pilots. A lot of people don't know about them and their role in World War II um, and exactly what they did for the country. But before we get into them specifically, let's take a little bit of the history and uh, watch your eyes on this slide. Oh, good. A little background. The 10 years prior to the start of World War II, a lot was happening. And it impacts on understanding what the posture of the United States was before it actually entered the war. So you see on this chart, from looking to the, to the west for the United States, Japan is very active in China. They are trying to expand their empire. Why are they expanding their empire? Japan is an island. It doesn't have any resources especially iron, and especially petroleum products. So it has to expand its empire so it can get those resources. It wants to be in control of the Pacific. So you notice you've got Manchuria. There was a settlement in 1932 for that. Things were quiet for a while, but then it picked back up in 1937. Okay, thank you. Looking over to America's east, Europe is in big trouble. What's driving the train for the whole world? The Great Depression. Anybody know what the uh, unemployment rate of the United States is right now? It's about three and a half, four percent, right? Do you know what the unemployment rate was in 1934 in the United States? 35%. 35%. The depression was really a depression. And that affected everything. Europe, the same problem. China, the same problem. Japan, the same problem. So for our friends in Japan and those in Germany, the answer to solving a depression is go to war. And that's exactly what they both did. Um, the 30s were kind of a hiatus uh, from the First World War. It just picked up right where, uh, where it left off. So you see all the things that went on as far as Europe is concerned with Hitler becoming chancellor and then dictator, and then they start their march 
uh, through Italy invading, invading Ethiopia, Spanish Civil War. Next thing you know, it's a shooting war in 1939. But what I wanted to point out specifically in blue, the United States remained neutral. 35 Neutrality Act, 36, 37, even in 1939 they passed the Neutrality Act. It is not our fight. That was the lesson of World War I. That's what those soldiers brought home from World War I. Europe is not our fight. And they were staunchly, staunchly against becoming involved in that war. Many people saw it coming. They knew we couldn't stay out of it. All kinds of people lobbied to do something to prepare the country for this coming conflict. Anybody know who Jackie Cochran is? You ever heard of her? Fantastically famous at the time, woman flyer. Probably as, as famous as the uh, one I just forgot. <laughs> Amelia Earhart. <laughs> yeah, as famous as Amelia Earhart. She won the Bendix Aviation Trophy. Anybody know what that is? Fastest flight from West Coast to East Coast, 1937, 1939. She and a couple other very famous women aviators um, were lobbying very heavily uh, to General Arnold, who was the chief of the Army Air Force at the time, to involve women in this, that they could do things that would help out in the coming conflict. They could see it happening. They had been to Germany. They knew the type of aircraft that the Germans were using and also the type of aircraft that the Japanese were using. So as you can see there, General Arnold asked uh, Jackie Cochran to go to fly a bomber, B-25 in this case, um, over to uh, the UK and to prove that women could actually do this because there was a big misconception about women and cars and women and airplanes and they couldn't do it and only exceptional people could do it, all that other kind of stuff. So she flew over there, and, uh, and, and they made a big deal out of it for positive publicity. She joined the British Air Transport Auxiliary, where women were flying everything from Spitfires to bombers to various locations in North Africa, especially Egypt, um, and other parts in the, in the Mediterranean area where the British had, had bases. Also ferrying them from factories to their airfields. So she did that starting in 1940. Um, in 41, as you can see there, she and another fairly famous uh, woman flyer in the United States, Nancy Hartness Love, submitted proposals to let women fly airplanes and to free up the men so that they could fly in combat. And there, there, you see the three uh, hallmarks of their plans, very similar plans, um, talking about ferrying aircraft from factories to bases towing drones. You know what a drone is? Anybody? It's a big, it's a, like a great big long windsock. You've seen them in an, air, in an airport. And they tow it behind a plane and, and guys shoot, shoot at it with live ammunition. And that's how they learn to, uh, to target uh, in air, anti-aircraft training. So that was their proposal. And so all this stuff was going on and then what the heck? Boom. Pearl Harbor. Game changer, right? All of a sudden, we got to do something. The United States declares war. The problem is they weren't prepared. There was a shortage of men, material, ammunition, everything. And so everything from industry to the armed services starts to scramble to get the country prepared to face the onslaught of what may be attack right on the American shore itself. Nobody knew what the Japanese could or would do on the western side. It was very obvious that Hitler was focusing on um, taking over the United Kingdom and then the plans obviously were to come for the United States. In 1942, with a shortage of manpower, 
and a shortage of people to fly planes from factories to uh, rallying points to consolidation points, he said, we need to take action on the plans that were submitted before by Nancy Love and get that auxiliary fairing squadron, the WFAS, up and running. You notice that the moment that that um, directive was received from Arnold, she sent out telegrams to 83 women and said, we need you right now. 27 of them showed up and they began ferrying aircraft. Right about on September 10th, when uh, this uh, new squadron was stood up, guess who flies back to the United States and lands and finds out that this thing is happening? Jackie Cochran. She storms into Arnold's office and says, what the hell is going on here? I gave you a plan. What's going on? And he, he backs down and he says, okay, okay, okay. Five days later, they formed a women's flying training detachment with her in charge. This is a school for women who have to get used to flying military aircraft. All the women that came in had a commercial license not to fly this military aircraft. So they start standing up the school. He says they need 500 pilots as soon as possible. In 1943, they consolidated the two organizations into what we know now as the WASP. The qualifications were tough. You can see them listed there. The top four, pretty good. 21, 35, good health, five feet, two inches tall. You had to be able to uh, touch the pedals of the aircraft and see out the windshield at the same time. Um, and a high school diploma. The problem is the commercial pilot's license. It cost over $500 in those dollars in those years to earn and be awarded that commercial pilot's license. It wasn't cheap. That's like $50,000 nowadays. So they first they said they had to have 500 hours to be able to do this and then they dropped it to 200 because they just couldn't get anybody to qualify and they had to make their own way to the training base down in texas the government wouldn't pay any of that they just had to show up they didn't think too many people would apply Twenty-five thousand women sent in applications now obviously a lot of them were not qualified right off the bat only 1,830 were actually accepted, mostly because they didn't have this commercial pilot's license. Uh, that was the biggest reason. They took four months of military flight training in, in, in an airfield down in Texas, trained on everything from single engine and dual engine aircraft to four engine heavy bombers. That's what they didn't know how to fly. From a pilot's perspective, you have to be trained and certified to fly the type of aircraft that you're going to become a pilot in command on. So they had to train on those aircraft, and they're a lot different than a commercial uh, aircraft, especially the fighters and the bombers. Much, much different, handled different, everything else. So the interesting thing is, and to remember, the WASPs were considered as civilian employees. They were not considered military. They had no rank. They were not considered military at all. But they did have a mascot, and I thought that was pretty cool. Her name is Fifi Nella, and she came from a book called The Gremlins, and the Gremlins were very, very popular because they would wreck airplane engines there was always a gremlin that screwed up the engine, or it screwed up the, the instruments, or it screwed up the plane. It was always gremlins, especially when you couldn't find out what caused the problem. It was the gremlins. So she is a gremlin, and you can see the little curly horns on the top of her flying hat there. And they use that on their, their flight jackets, as you can see over there on your right. 
And after training, in 100, they were stationed at 122 air bases across the United States, and they had all kinds of missions. I did not know this last fact. 80% of the ferrying missions of aircraft were done by women. Really quite something. And they flew everything. 78 different types of aircraft they flew. Uh, the one that on the left, those four women coming off of that, excuse me, B-17. I find it interesting that the B-17's name was Pistol Packin' Mama. <laughs> Shirley Slade, the 24-year-old, was the subject of a very, very big article in Life magazine talking about the WASP. It was a very positive article, too. Very interesting for the times. You notice the uniform down in the lower right. It's a, it's a kind of a, a slate blue. Jackie Corgan, Cochran, sorry, um, contacted her friends in Bergdorf Goodman in New York and said, I want you to design a uniform because I don't want my women flying without a uniform. So Bergdorf designed their uniform in this very interesting slate blue. Um, and if you ever see pictures in color of the time, it's, it's a very interesting color and they're very, very much tailored business suits. But this work is not safe. Flying airplanes is not a safe job especially some of the things that the women were asked to do. 38 of these women were killed because of accidents, engine malfunction, all kinds of different reasons. 38 of them and 40 were injured also because of accidents, but some of them were actually shot. Remember I told you that they towed targets and people shot at them with live ammunition? Sometimes they weren't very good shots. And the women were shot in the feet and the legs because they hit the airplane, not the, uh, not the sock they were supposed to hit. First casualty was Cornelia Ford. Interesting story you can see there. If you've ever seen the movie Torah, 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 there's a part in it where it shows a woman in a Stearman biplane, and she's giving a flight lesson when all the zeros come in on the on Oahu. That's her. She was the one that was giving that flight training that day, and is the first American pilot ever to be exposed to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. She landed the plane and immediately volunteered to do anything to fight these guys. Unfortunately, she was killed in a, in a flight accident with students that were flying in a group. One of the students didn't do what he was supposed to do. His undercarriage tore one of the wings off her aircraft. It went right out of the sky, and it, she couldn't get out and kill her. A number of accidents like that, too. The interesting thing about them, remember, they are civilians. If a wasp died, her colleagues paid for her funeral. They pitched in their money to do that. The families could not put a gold star in the window. They weren't military. Nor could they drape an American flag over the casket. This is not a military casualty. Obviously, a lot of hard feelings on that one. There was a move as more and more and more women flew more and more aircraft and more of these kind of accidents happened and they had more and more important work to do. A move from Jackie Corcoran and General Arnold to get them to be recognized as a military air arm. A lot of resistance to that. However, this Congressman John Costello, who's from California, he started to actively lobby Congress to have them designated as a branch. 
the War Department said, wait a minute, there's no separate branch for pilots. We have pilots in the Army, we have pilots in the Navy, we have pilots in the Marine Corps, there's no separate branch for them. There's no precedent for it. We don't think it ought to, it ought to happen. We don't need to make them special. Representative Costello introduces um, a bill in the House, and it goes before this House Military Committee. General Arnold says they're all good flyers. They're not going to fly in combat. They are doing a job right now. We need to recognize it. Well, the media, back then as today, decided that they were against it. They were against this. Women should stay at home. These jobs should be done by men, and they have no business being there. And in fact, Drew Pearson even went so far as to say that Arnold was influenced by Jackie Corrigan, and that, uh, or Cochran rather, and um, that uh, this didn't make any sense to do. So it was a hard sell. House Committee on Civilian Civil Service reported that it considered them unnecessary. Now we're into 1944. Unnecessary. The military was getting big enough, and it was too expensive. And it would cost, as you see there, an estimated $50 million to make them a separate military branch. And they thought it was unnecessary. And oh, by the way, if you wanted to do something like that, you had to do it legislatively. They couldn't just create it out of thin air. The War Department couldn't do it on its own. Well, all of this really angered Jackie Cochran, and she threw down the gauntlet, an ultimatum, if you will. Either commission them and recognize what they're doing, or disestablish them right away. So the House did consider the bill, and it lost by 19 votes. Also, a report that came before the Congress, just before they voted, there were an excess of male pilots and more in the training stream. So basically, it rendered them, the women pilots, unnecessary. That's what they were, uh, <clears throat> they were told. General Arnold said, the handwriting is on the wall for the WASP. We're not going to get this done. Now, he was a strong proponent of recognizing them as military members, but even so, the War Department said, no, disband them. So he did. By December 20, 1944, the WASP were to be no more. Interesting, though, <coughs> and I think very much uh, a credit to General Arnold, his foresight, he directed all commanding officers at the air fields where these women were flying to give them a certificate similar to an honorable discharge. And that certificate stated that they had flown military aircraft in service to the military in World War II. Okay? This will play a big role in the future. He was very, very smart to do that. And nowadays, when people get discharges, they come from the Pentagon, okay, um, Department of Defense, and it's centralized. In those days, the commanding officers of installations signed discharge certificates for their people. They weren't centralized. They were hand-typed, they were signed by hand by either the post adjutant or by the commanding officer himself. So that's why that order was issued. The WASP are phasing out. What did they accomplish? They <coughs> freed more than 900 male pilots for combat duty. That's, that's incredible. That's a force multiplier right there that you had those men available. They delivered more than 12,000 aircraft, and as I said, 78 different types. Cargo planes, fighter planes, bombers, light, heavy, everything you can imagine they flew. 60 million air miles. They flew those airplanes to places like Alaska, Hawaii, and in some cases, 
to England itself, although it was not publicized. They weren't supposed to do that. They were supposed to drop them off either in Labrador or Greenland and let males fly them into the European theater of operation. How valid that is, I don't know. These are just stories that come out from the time, so we don't know exactly how valid they were or not. But they flew chaplains from base to base, like you have in there in Sundays, and they also conducted flight tests on this, this got me. When they would repair aircraft, whether they were damaged in the United States or they were came back from uh, the war theaters to be repaired and replaced and refurbished, they would have to test fly them before they would turn them over to the government again. So these women would fly these test flights and uh, to make sure that the planes were ready for the combat pilots to take them. And I did not know this, but some of the women, like uh, Miss Ann Carl here, tested jet aircraft before jet aircraft ever entered the inventory of the Army Air Forces. The other thing that's interesting, a great story I heard, those of you who are aficionados of aircraft at that area, you know that the B-29, although the development of the B-29 Superfortress started in the 1930s, it was a radical departure from all the aircraft that had come before. There were a lot of systems in it that were brand new technology. They had a lot of problem in its development. There were a number of crashes with the B-29 prototypes and the first ones coming out of uh, the Boeing facility. It got the reputation among pilots very quickly as being a widow maker. And the pilots, almost mutinied and told General Arnold they wouldn't fly it because it was too dangerous. General Arnold had a whole bunch of pilots who were graduating, some were coming back after their tours, and I believe this was in California, in a very large Air Force base or airfield in California. And he was briefing them about the Japanese attacks on the Japanese island and the use of the B-29 and getting a lot of cold reception from the pilots. They're in this huge hangar and the hangar doors are open, right? Now all of a sudden they hear the roar of engines and this B-29 <laughs> lands right in front of them. I'm, you know, out in the, out in the taxiway or out in the uh, <clears throat> in the landing strip, taxis up right up in front of this great big hangar where all these pilots are assembled. And the plane comes to a stop, the engines feather and shut down. The crew door on a B-29 is under, it's, it's in the belly, okay? The crew door drops down and out of it come four women the pilot, the co-pilot, the navigator, and the radio engineer, four women, and they come up and they tell General Arnold, we bought your B-29, sir, flew like a dream. His whole plan was to shame all those pilots. If women could fly this, then they better well fly it. And that's what he turned around and told them. I thought that was a great story. <laughs> so anyway, just before they decommissioned the WASP. They formed the Order of Fifi Nello. And it, it, much like the American Legion and the VFW, it gave the women an opportunity to keep in touch, um, to learn about each other, what they were doing, and they had newsletters. They also tried to influence some uh, legislation about the Air Force and um, things having to do with aviation. And what really struck me is that for, it went more than 60 years this thing was in operation. They finally disbanded in 2009. So there you see some of them. <clears throat> I really like the older pictures. Those were taken in, in with uh, Ms. Strophus 
2017, that was taken. Uh, Behadu is 2012. Dorothy Olson was very interesting. She passed away in 2020 at the age of 103. She said she flew P-38s, the Lightning. She liked it a lot, but her favorite was the P-51 because it could go so fast. Here's one of the uh, Fifi Nella meetings, and you can see their uniforms here. And uh, the Fifi Nella badge on uh, this young woman right there. So an interest that they, you know, met and they, they had their careers. None of them, of course, got a job as a pilot after the war. They wouldn't, none of the airlines would hire them. Some of them were, became flight attendants, but no airlines would hire them. Um, in 72, the Navy says, we're going to accept women into our flight training program. And they're the first women to fly military aircraft. The order of PP Nella said, are you kidding me? We did this almost 30 years ago. Don't give us that stuff. So they got together that same year in their, at their meeting, the union, and said, look, if they're going to take women in the military, we should be credited as veterans for what we did in World War II. And so they began a push for legislation to be recognized as military veterans and be eligible for veterans' benefits. That legislation was helped along by General Arnold's son, at that time a colonel in the Air Force, and also a guy from uh, Arizona by the name of Goldwater. Ever hear of him? Yeah. Barry was behind this 100%. In 75, the Air Force jumped on and said, yes, we're going to allow women to fly. It only was with cargo planes. Uh, same thing with the Navy, it was cargo uh, and uh, Orion flights and things like that. No, no combat, but we're going to allow them to fly too. But, so 33 years later, finally, at the behest of Senator Goldwater and a lot urging of a lot of different people, finally, Congress passed legislation which granted them a veteran status. Really amazing, it took them 33 years to get to get recognized. Some almost 20 years after that, there was a move to really recognize the service of these women. And so the proposal was made by a then Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force, Nicole Bachelowski, to honor them with a Congressional Medal. Those are not given out very lightly or very often. Um, but as you can see, it started in 2007. In 2009, Congress approved it, and there's President Obama signing the legislation and making the Congressional Medal real. And that's what it looked like. <clears throat> as it said, these were awarded to the WASP themselves that were still living or given to their family members. So, belated recognition, but some recognition. This is their legacy. Jeannie Levitt, first Air Force female fighter pilot. She retired as a major general. Remember I told you about Nicole Machalowski? She flew the first woman to fly with the Thunderbirds. That's the Air Force demonstration team. Captain uh, Katie Higgins, first female pilot with the Blue Angels. And if any of you were watching the Super Bowl this year when the Blue Angels flew over, all four of those planes were piloted by women. All four. So the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, all have women aviators, and they do fly in combat, not to mention women astronauts. 
That's the legacy of the Wasp. So thank you for your attention. I hope it was interesting for you. A little piece of history from World War II. A lot of people miss. But they really did show dedicated, selfless service and were trailblazers for military women pilots. Thank you very much. Very